This is section 9.7, Taylor polynomials and approximations. All right, so um, what we're going to be doing is finding a polynomial um, that approximates another function. And the prime consideration is that you certainly want that polynomial function that you find to agree with the function you're doing at at least one point, c. And so we'll want p of c and f of c to be the same. Okay. And we will be um, thinking of this c value as the center of the expansion of the polynomial to uh, match the value of the function. Uh, this will be the center. So this is the prime consideration. Um, of course, what that means is that's a point of intersection of the function and the polynomial. We want that to happen. Now, the next consideration would be that we would want the slope of the tangent line of the polynomial to be the same as the slope of the function at C. So we will want those to have the same first derivative values at C so that the slopes of their tangent line are in agreement. And when we do that, we're actually going to be able to find a linear equation of a polynomial if we have one point that they agree on and if they have the same slope. Okay. So um, with, that, with that given, we could find an equation of a, of a line. So. Um, if we're going to have an equation of a line, that's actually a first-degree polynomial. And the polynomials we're going to look at, um, we're going to write them in the order of increasing powers on x. Um, so the coefficient of the x to the 0 term, which we're going to call a sub naught, um, plus a sub 1, which is the coefficient of the x to the first term. And then when we get to higher powers, it'll be a sub 2 times x squared and a sub 3 times x cubed. That subscript is just making sure that that's the um, coefficient for that power of x. Okay. So um, let's do a, uh, an example. Uh, where we're going to start out with a function that we're trying to approximate with a polynomial. e to the x is a good one to do this for. And we're trying to find, first of all, a linear polynomial that would be a good estimate of what e to the x is and what e to the x does. So um, we're going to need to know for this what f prime is which e to the x is the coolest function ever, so it is its own derivative. And we're also going to need to know the first derivative of our polynomial. And of course, the derivative of a constant is 0, plus the derivative of a constant times a function is that constant, times the derivative of that function, and the derivative of x is 1. So the first derivative is a sub 1. Okay, so using these two requirements, I'm going to want p of c, so p sub 1 of c, which is equal to a sub naught plus a sub 1 times c, needs to equal f of c, which is e to the c. Okay, so that's the first requirement we're going to have. And the second requirement we're going to have is that the first derivative at c, if we put c into the first derivative of our polynomial, first degree polynomial, uh, since it's a constant, we'll just get back that constant. And that should equal f prime of c, which is e to the c. And we want both of those to be true. Well, the good news is on the first one, I'm sorry, on the second, then what we just did, 
um, we now know what a sub one is. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do to make this a little bit more specific um, to um, a particular value of x as the center, let me come back here and say, let's let for this problem the center be zero. Okay. So what that becomes is a sub one is e to the zero, which is one. So we now know that a sub one is one. Then using c value of zero, that means that a sub naught plus a sub one, which we now know is one from the work down below, times c, which we are now assigning the value of zero, that should equal e to the zero. And so um, a sub zero equals one. And so as a result, our first degree polynomial is a sub naught, which we just found to be one, plus a sub one, which is one times x. So one plus x. Now, if we look at a graph of this, and I would suggest um, that it might be a good idea for you to look at a graphing calculator um, for this because my sketch will not be as good. Um, set this up. Okay, so I'm gonna graph um, the function um, e to the x. So let's see, e to the zero is one e to the first is about 2.71828. e squared is going to take this off of this grid. e to the negative first. Let me see if I can get my calculator here. Is about 0.367. e to the negative two. Is about 0.135. Okay, just to get a, a few values here. So this is what our e to the x graph looks like. So that's f. Then if I graph uh, this polynomial function, that's the graph of a line with a y-intercept of 1, which it should have because when x is 0, we wanted them to share that point and have that point in common. And um, then we'll use the slope, which is one, to go up one over one and draw that line. And of course, since that's a line, that's a line that is a point of tangency to that curve at that place. And so this is something we could have already done even back in calculus one, is to have found the equation of the tangent line. Um, this goes further than that, so um, we are going to tread a little bit into territory where you're familiar. Okay, that's that's going to happen with these. So, not to be dismayed. Now, the third requirement we might want to make is not only do we want their first derivatives to be the same number at c, we would like for their second derivatives. second derivative at c to be the same. And as it turns out, uh, the level of the derivative is the power of x we're going to use. So like on the last one, when we equated the first derivatives to each other right here, um, we were doing that with a linear um, equation x to the first. So um, let me set up our degree two polynomial. So our degree two polynomial is going to be a sub one, I'm sorry, a sub naught plus a sub one 
x plus a sub 2 squared, uh, a sub 2 x squared, excuse me. Okay, so um, we're going to want all of the conditions we've met so far to be true. So we're going to need the uh, first derivative of that equation as well as the second derivative of that equation. Okay. And we're also going to need to know for the function the same levels of derivatives. So we'll need to know the function, its first derivative, coolest function ever, and its second derivative. coolest function ever. You can see why I picked it. It makes the derivative is super easy to do no matter what level of derivative we're talking about. Okay, so we're going to want these things to be true. That we want p sub 2 of c, and we're still letting c be 0. Okay, so that's going to be true for the rest of the time with this example. So um, we want p sub 2 of 0 to equal f of 0. So that's going to be a sub naught plus a sub 1 times 0 is 0 plus a sub 2 times 0 squared is 0. And we want that to equal e to the 0, which means, of course, that a sub 0 is 1. just like it was last time. a sub 0 was 1 before. Okay. Then the second thing we want to make true is that we want, for the second degree polynomial, the first degree evaluated at uh, 0, our center, to equal the first derivative of our function at 0. So they have the same slope of a tangent line there. So substituting 0 into the polynomial's first derivative, that'll be a sub 1, plus 2a sub 2 times 0 is 0, and of course f prime of 0 is e to the 0, so a sub 1 is 1, just like it was last time. Then we want now the second derivatives evaluated at the center, 0, second derivatives to equal each other so that at that place they have the same concavity is what we're forcing. And so the second derivative uh, doesn't matter what x is, any input will give us the constant 2a sub 2. And um, the second derivative of f at 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. And so a sub 2 is 1 half. And so that means that our second degree polynomial is um, a sub naught, which is 1, plus a sub 1, which is 1, times x, so x, plus a sub 2, which is 1 half, times x squared. Okay? So. Um, I'm graphing this in my calculator right now. So I've got e to the x in y1. In y2, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and graph the 1 plus x. And then in y3, I'm going to type 1 plus x plus um, x squared divided by 2. And I'm going to do this in a zoom for window. Just hit zoom, then 4. So you can see what that looks like. Okay. And let's see if I can make this pretty clear. Um, the function looks like this. That's f. And again, 
the um, linear equation is the tangent line to the curve at zero. So that's p sub one. And then it looks like p sub two is a parabola that looks sort of like this. That's p sub two. And the thing I'd like for you to notice is that as long as we're really close to x equals zero, that line is not a bad idea of what the y value of the function is. At zero, it's exactly the same. But if you move slightly to the right, so if you hit trace, and right now it should pop up to e to the x first, hit the down arrow, and you're on the y sub 2 equals 1 plus x. Move over one space so the x is 0.1. Then go up, and you'll be back on the function, e to the x. And look at the y value, 1.1051709. And then I'm going to toggle down again. That's going to put me on the line, and that's 1.1. So go up and down between those two. Look at the y values. The y value of the line is not very far away from the y value that's actual y value when x is 0.1 for e to the x. Now, um, get back on y1 equals e to the x. Now toggle up, which will actually go to the bottom of the list, to y3, and that's the quadratic equation. Look at its y value, 1.105. Go down to get back to the e to the x, 1.1051709. That's even better. That's even a whole lot closer. So the idea is that as we get higher and higher degree polynomials, um, we'll get better and better approximations uh, as long as we're close enough to the center for it to be meaningful. And what I mean by that is, um, let me show you what what's, uh, would not be good. Let's say that I were at, way out here at this x value right here. Would the uh, value of the line right there be a good approximation of the um, actual value of the function? No, look, there's a great big space between those. Well, even worse, look at that uh, quadratic. At that x value, that quadratic is way up here. Is that point way up there a good approximation of the pink one at that same x? No, not at all. So if we move very far away from the center, we don't expect it to be a good approximation. But if you stay pretty close to the center, like 0.1 or 0.2 over, and you can play with that, just toggle over now to 0.2 and toggle up and down between um, the three and see, uh, you should see that um, the one we want to have the value of e to the x, the line is pretty good, but the quadratic is probably a whole lot better. Yeah, it's a whole lot better. So um, that's kind of the idea behind this, is that that's what we're trying to do. You can also toggle over to like negative 0.1 and compare the three. Um, and again, the quadratic is better. It's closer to the actual function value than the line is. So again, that's the, the idea that the larger power of our polynomial will get us a better and better approximation. So. Let's go to the next level. Now I want, and, and I've talked about, you know, point of intersection. That was when um, the, they agreed at the function and the uh, polynomial that they had that point of intersection. And then we added, they have the same slope. That was the first derivative idea. And they have the same concavity at C that was the second derivative idea. Now I'm going to go to the third derivative idea, and uh, I'm not going to have a good physical explanation for what we're trying to make the same. But I'm hoping that you realize that it's just going to get better and better. The larger polynomial we have, the better it will be. So let's do a third degree polynomial. P sub 3 is a sub naught plus a sub 1x to the first plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 3x cubed. 
it's supposed to be a 3, x cubed. And of course, our function is still e to the x. And we still have a center at 0. So um, if we're going to go all the way to the third derivative, we're going to need to do that for our third degree polynomial as well as for our function. So the first derivative of the polynomial is a sub 1 plus 2a sub 2 plus 3a sub... Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to write something. 2a sub 2x plus 3a sub 3x squared. Then the second derivative of that polynomial of degree 3 to start with is going to be 2a sub 2 plus 3 times 2. I know that's 6. I'm just being lazy. a sub 3 x, and then the third derivative of that third degree polynomial ends up being 3 times 2 times 1 a sub 3. I am intentionally not simplifying that. In just a second, I'm hoping that will become a clear thing. Then the derivatives of our function, coolest function ever, are all e to the x. So those are easy. Just got to write them down. Sort of as proof that we're thinking about the derivative each time, although it's not changing. All right. So. So I want p sub 3 of 0 to equal, actually, yeah, I guess I'll do that, to equal f of 0. So um, p sub 3 of 0 is going to be a sub naught plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals e to the 0 which is 1. That's the same result we had before. Okay. p sub 3 prime of 0. We want that to equal f prime of 0. So um, that's a sub 1 plus 0 plus 0 equals e to the 0, which is 1. Also, a result we've seen before. As it turns out, as you'll see in this next stage, um, once you get to the higher powers, the a sub values, a sub 0, a sub 1, the ones you've already found, they aren't going to change. So once you've established that a sub naught is 1 in this problem and a sub 1 is 1, it's going to be that for the whole problem. Okay, so anyway, um, substituting in 0 for each x, that's going to be 2 times 1, a sub 2. Yes, I just inserted a 1. I'm hoping you'll see why in just a second. Equals e to the 0, which is 1. So a sub 2 is 1 over 2 times 1. Okay. And 1 half is what we got before. So that's no surprise. And then the third derivative evaluated at 0. I want that to equal the third derivative of our function at 0. And so uh, that third derivative of the polynomial is a constant, 3 times 2 times 1, a sub 3, equals e to the 0, which is 1. So a sub 3 is 1 divided by 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, so I'm going to ask you if you can uh, 
leap to a conclusion here about why I was leaving those numbers unsimplified. Well, you may see that a sub 2 is really 1 over 2 factorial. You may have noticed when I put in that 1, oh yeah, that's what factorial means. And this one over here is 1 over 3 factorial. So let's see if that's true all the way through. Could I rewrite 1 as 1 over something factorial? Well, if we go backwards from this level over here where it's 3 factorial for a sub 3 in the denominator, and then 2 factorial where it's a sub 2, it seems likely that this should be 1 factorial. And does that actually equal 1? Yes, it does. So now go backwards one more level. And according to the pattern I see, this should be 1 over 0 factorial. So it appears to me that the uh, subscript on A is telling me the number factorial in the denominator underneath 1. And of course, is 1 over 0 factorial actually equal to 1 is the next question. And we define 0 factorial as 1. So yes, 1 over 1 is 1. And so that seems to be working. So that means that our third degree polynomial is a sub naught, which is 1, plus a sub 1x. Actually, let me back up and I'm going to write it in an unsimplified form on purpose because I want you to start thinking of this uh, in this way. And that's actually times x to the 0. It's an understood power of x because x to the 0 is 1. Um, plus a sub 1, which is 1 over 1 factorial, x to the first. And again, I'm, I'm not writing it in a simplified form on purpose so that you can kind of see what's going on here. So plus 1 over 2 factorial, that's what a sub 2 is, times x squared plus a sub 3, which is 1 over 3 factorial, x cubed. And that is our third degree polynomial approximation of this function e to the x centered at 0. So I'll turn my calculator back on. Um, and I'm now going to graph um, this polynomial, which I want to type the simplified version. So let me write that down just so it's easy. 1 over 0 factorial is 1 times x to 0 is 1. So that's 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 sixth x cubed when you simplify. For typing purposes, that's way easier than what I had written down. The uh, written down version was supposed to be um, so that you start seeing the pattern that's developing. Okay, so I've, I've typed in 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6. And then I'm going to graph that. And I'm actually turning off y sub 2, the linear function, and y sub 3, the quadratic one. And the way you turn them off without deleting them is to go over and hover your cursor over the equal sign and hit enter. And if it's not got a black box around the equal sign, it's turned off. It's inactive. So y sub 1 is active and y sub 4 is active. That's all I really want to see right now because I've already seen the other ones. So um, the function Oops. And I want to stick with my color scheme that I picked. So the function was in pink. And it looks like this. Okay. And let's make this one in red, I guess. Um, and it, on my screen, looks sort of like this. I'm going to do my best to sort of mimic what I'm seeing on my screen. About right there, it looks like they kind of overlap and are in the same place. 
They're not exactly in the same place, but they look like it in this window. And eventually you see a little bit of separation up here, kind of hard to see because they're really close together. And so that is our third degree polynomial, um, whereas the pink one is our function. And so as long as we stay pretty close to C equals zero, because the graphs are almost in the same place. If you hit the trace and go over and, and look at Y values, they're not exactly the same place, but they're really, really close. And not only is it for C close to zero, but what's happening is as I add to the powers of, of X, not only is the, the approximation near zero good, it appears that it's starting to be good for a broader set of numbers. So for this part of the graph between these two green um, marks that I've made, they look almost identical. Okay, And so that's broader than it was up above. If I go up here, um, the quadratic looked pretty good. I'm going to have to use a different color. Um, the quadratic looked pretty good from about here to there. So it's not as broad of a category. And of course, the tangent line only looks good as if they were overlapping at the one point of intersection. So the width that we're getting of x values where they look pretty close to each other, it's hard to tell the difference between them, that's broadening out. So we're moving out away from the center. And notice it doesn't appear to be totally symmetric with respect to the center, and that's fine if it's not. Um, we seem to be moving out from the center so that it looks really good for more x's than just really close to c. We can now go a little bit further away from c, and like for example with this one piece of 3 that we have right now still, hit trace, move over to about where x is 1.1. Now, let's make it 1. That'll be easier. Of course, the function is 2.718. If you toggle down to the y sub 4, it's 2.66666. That's pretty close. Even one away from our center, we've got pretty close approximation. That's not perfect, and we don't expect it to be perfect, but it's getting good. Um, if I put 1 into the line, Actually, I did. It's right there. There's a there's a dot right there, and that's not very close to that dot there where x is 1 on the function. So we are getting a better approximation further out as we add to the powers of our polynomial. So I've said this before, um, and I'll say it again. We could go through that whole process again for p sub 4. Not a problem. We can do that. But So that's like substituting into a formula to build a, a series or a sequence even. But if we see a pattern and we're pretty sure our pattern's right, maybe we don't have to go through all that process and we can just say, hey, I think I know what the next one is. So I'd like for you to take a second and commit to what you think p sub 4 of x will be. Just think if you can expand the pattern all by yourself. I'll give you a second or two to do that. All right, so let's see how you did all by yourself. Hopefully I gave you enough time. Oh, I guess you could have just paused the recording. I should think about that next time. Um, the first part of this has already been established, and it's true for all greater powers. So anything we find early on is going to be true. For the next iteration, we're just basically adding one new thing. Hopefully that's something that you kind of noticed. Okay, so that much of it's the same. So what would the next one be? Hopefully you're saying 1 over 4 factorial multiplied by x to the fourth. If that's what you said, you were right. 
And please um, take a moment and graph that on your calculator. Um, it'll look just like this one up here, except for 4 factorial. You might want to know that that's 1 over 24 x to the fourth. And see if, once you've graphed it, does it seem to agree as long as you're close, relatively close to c equals 0? And is that broadening out even further to include more values where it looks like they're actually identical graphically. They're not, but they look like it. So now write p sub 5. And of course, anytime I say to do something like that, like graph it or write p sub 5, you might just pause the video and see, take the time to see if you can do it all by yourself. So pause the video right now and write p sub 5. So up through the x to the fourth term, it looks just like the last answer we got. And now the next one that we add should be, and it is, 1 over 5 factorial times x to the fifth. And you can graph that one. And you can take this as far as you want to. Uh, if we were in class, I would probably would have pre-typed like p sub 10 or p sub 12 or something in. And um, what that looks like, if I go far enough, is that the, the two curves for the Zoom 4 window look exactly the same, the whole window. Of course, if you then zoom out, you can see where they're not the same. But it's kind of cool to see, oh my gosh, they're green, at least visually, for every point in this window. And so it broadens out so far that it feels like you've, you've got perfect agreement. Of course it's not, except at the point of intersection at x equals zero. Um, they're not the same, but they're really, really, really close to each other. Okay, so um, now um, let's say then what we think this would be for, skip a few, for p sub n of x. Well, we've already established that the first part that we have doesn't change, so all of this is good. Nothing wrong with one of these things that we wrote down already. And what you need to do is to write enough of it so you've established the pattern very clearly and usually th four or so, maybe five terms, establishes that pretty clearly. That's a three up there. So I'm going to say that's probably enough to get the pattern. So go plus, dot, dot, dot. And then if we're going to stop at n, use the piece of five as an example, what will the last one be? Well, it should be one over n factorial times x to the nth. Okay. Now, that's what our guess for p sub n. That's what we think it would be. Now, going on to the next page, Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials. Now, the center doesn't have to be zero. It is the simplest version where it is zero, but it doesn't have to be. And if our center is anything else, um, the polynomial being centered at some other place, it, this is what it will look like. Now this is getting away from e to the x. Okay, This is now back to the more general terms. Um, any nth degree polynomial will look like this. And I could have x to the... Um, x minus c to the 0 power for that first term. And I could write a 1 exponent in that term. I'm just not because you know we're writing the, the, a little bit simpler version. So if you want the center to be elsewhere, you just shift the graph c units by subtracting c from x. 
and that just shifts the graph over uh, C units. But you have to do that for every X. So this is always X minus C. And of course, if C is zero, um, X minus zero is just X. And that's how you get you know, an, an example like above where those are just powers of X, not powers of X minus two or whatever. At any rate, um, so for this general polynomial, it will look like this through the nth term. It's because it's p sub n of x, we've got to go all the way to that one. So that's a sub n times x minus c to the nth is the last one. Okay. So what I'd like to do with this general looking thing is I'd like to do what we did for f of x equals e to the x, that whole process, um, but in a more general way. So I'd like to start by taking the first derivative of this. Of course, the derivative of the constant a sub naught is zero, plus um, the next one, the derivative of a constant times something is that constant a sub one times the derivative of what follows it. The derivative of x minus c is one, so times one, which I'm not going to write. Um, for the next one, bring down the two times a sub two. It's supposed to be a two x minus c to the first plus 3 a sub 3 3 a sub 3 x minus c squared plus dot 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 and the next one will be n times a sub n x minus c to be reduced by one power. Okay, the second derivative of p sub n is going to be 2a sub 2 times 1 plus 3 times 2 a sub 3 times x minus c to the first plus dot 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 plus n times n minus 1 times a sub n x minus c to the n minus 2. And then the third derivative is going to be 3 times 2 times 1 a sub 3 plus dot 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 plus n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times a sub n times x minus c to the n minus 3. Okay, so Let's skip and see if we can find the nth derivative of p sub n. Remember when you have uh, four or bigger as an order of a derivative, you put that number in parentheses. So that n in parentheses up there means the nth derivative of p sub n. Um, and what I want to do is I want to look at some of these if this had been p sub 3, look at the line above. If this had been p sub 3, um, we would have stopped. Let me, let me go back a, a line. Um, do the second derivative. If that had been p sub 3 of x the whole time, um, so uh, if it's p sub 3, the last term would have been the one I just underlined. And if, if we got down to the third derivative, if n is 3, then where did that a sub 3 go? It went right here. And that's all we'd have. Because if it's p sub 3, we don't have an a sub 4, x minus c to the fourth, because we're stopping at 3. So if that's true, 
then if we stop at the nth derivative of p sub n, what will we have? Well, it's going to be n, mi n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot, 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 until we get down to 3 times 2 times 1 times a sub n. That'll be the last term. Notice there's no x here if it's p sub 3. There's no x in that first term. So there's no x here. And um, that could be simplified n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., until you get down to 3 times 2 times 1. That's n factorial times a sub n. Okay. So what I'd like for us to do now is take all of those polynomials we just found for the generic p sub n, and I want to evaluate each one Evaluate these polynomials um, when x is equal to c. And x is equal to c. Then, in each case, I want to solve to find out what a is in each case. So. Um, we're going to solve for each of the constants. Generically speaking, that would be for each of the um, a sub somethings, a sub n generically, yes. Okay, so let's start that process. So p sub n of c, going up to the top one up here. So these are the polynomials we're evaluating at x equals c. Okay, so p sub n of c, going up to that very top one, is a sub naught plus the next term is going to be a sub 1 times c minus c, and of course c minus c is 0, and a sub 1 times 0 is 0, so we'll get a 0 added to that, which won't change it. And in fact, every single term after it, when we put c in for x, we're going to get a bunch of zeros. So, p sub n of c is a sub naught. Okay. Now let's do p prime, uh, p sub n prime of c, and we're going to get a sub one plus a bunch of zeros. P sub n second derivative evaluated at c. What we're going to get is 2a sub 2 and a bunch of zeros. Maybe you're seeing a pattern here. I hope you are. The third derivative of p sub n evaluated at c is going to give me 3 factorial a sub 3. It's easier than write 3 times 2 times 1. Um, that's the third derivative, kind of hard to tell. That's three marks. That's a little bit better. And the fourth derivative, I don't even have the fourth derivative up there, but you ought to be able to tell me what it should be. It should be four factorial a sub four. And if you understood that pattern-wise, then let's go to the nth derivative. So the nth derivative of p sub n evaluated at c should be n factorial because of course the degree of the uh, derivative 4 in the last one we did is the number factorial times a sub same number so a sub n okay so um, then I said to solve for the constant, so a sub naught is, of course, p sub n of c. Um, that's 
and we're going to set that equal to the function that we're trying to approximate evaluated at C and um, a sub 1 is p sub n prime at c, which we're going to set equal to f prime of c. Um, 2 a sub 2, well, wait a minute, hold on. Um, I didn't do this at first because they were already by themselves, but if I wanted to get a sub 2 by itself, um, I would have to divide both sides by 2, or you can also say multiply by 1 half. And so that's going to be equated to 1 half of f prime, double prime of c. Oh, and I forgot to write the double prime back here. Excuse me. And let's see. If we solve for a sub 3, that's going to be 1 over 3 factorial p sub n third derivative of c, which should be equal to 1 over 3 factorial third derivative of f of c. And a sub 4 is 1 over 4 factorial. fourth derivative of p, the 4 up there, evaluated at c. So that's going to be equated to functions fourth derivative evaluated at c multiplied by 1 over 4 factorial. etc. And that means that a sub n is 1 over n factorial, the nth derivative of p sub n evaluated at c, which we'll want to have equal to the function output of the same thing. So 1 over n factorial, f's nth derivative evaluated at c. And so, if we took um, each of those constants that we just got, and um, I know it's been a while since, if we were on a big board, I could have walked over and pointed at something that I already wrote, but that's not how we're doing this, unfortunately. Um, our nth degree polynomial, if you recall, in general looks like this. This is what I would walk over and say, hey, look at this but I'm not, so I'm going to write it again. Plus dot 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 plus a sub n x to the nth. That's the last one. So if I were to substitute in for each of those a with a subscript, a sub naught, oops, can't see it up there. A sub naught is f of c. Plus a sub 1, which is f prime of c, times x. Minus c, oops, I forgot to write the parenthesis back up. Oh, well, dang, I messed up the first one because, oh my gosh, oh, dang it. Okay, I might have to kind of start this again because I forgot that we were uh, using a center C that's not necessarily zero. And I just forgot what I was doing there for a minute. Okay. So change this back. 
Is that back? Okay. So p sub n of x is a sub naught plus a sub 1 times x minus c. See, if I'd written this down and walked over and pointed to it, I would not have made that error. Uh, so there is something good about face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, it's easier to leave things on the board and point to them than to start rewriting them again and potentially make a bunch of mistakes, like forgetting to have the minus c as part of the binomial each time. Well, I'll quit complaining. All right. So that's the general polynomial centered at C, which is not necessarily centered at zero. Okay, so this right now so far is good because a sub naught is f of C and a sub one is f prime of C times x minus C. And then a sub two is one half. In fact, I want to write that as f double prime of C over two factorial times x minus c squared. And then a sub three is the third derivative evaluated at c over three factorial times x minus c cubed. See all the threes in that one term? That's not a coincidence. That's going to happen. I'm going to move down a little bit. And then the next one will be plus, let me write it down here, the fourth derivative evaluated at c over 4 factorial times x minus c to the fourth plus dot dot dot. And then the nth one will be the nth derivative of f evaluated at c divided by n factorial times x minus c to the nth. So um, that is your uh, Taylor polynomial, is what we call that polynomial we just wrote. Um, um, and if you look on the page where it says Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials, and there's a box on definitions of the nth Taylor polynomial and nth Maclaurin polynomial, that's what those are. Now, I am going to add something that I think helps you not make mistakes because I've had a lot of students in my lifetime and I know what happens. Um, you're going to get going with the first two terms and think you're going great, and you will be. And then when you get to the third term, you're going to forget to divide by 2 factorial. And then the next one, you're going to forget to divide by 3 factorial. So I'm going to add to this that if you'll write, force yourself to always write, the derivative over that number factorial, like for the first derivative over one factorial, and um, this would be over zero factorial. If you'll force yourself to write those, you won't forget by the time you get to the third one to divide by two factorial, and for the fourth one divide by three factorial, etc. So it's not the way it's written in the definition, but I would suggest that you do that. Um, not a requirement, but it will help you not make a mistake because I've seen too many students forget to start dividing by the factorials. Now, if, um, if C happens to be zero, we call that a Maclaurin polynomial where C is specifically zero. Um, so in that case, your p sub n of x would be f of specifically zero over zero factorial plus f prime of zero over one factorial 
times x minus 0, which is just x, plus f double prime evaluated at 0, divided by 2 factorial, times x minus 0, which is x squared, plus the third derivative at 0, divided by 3 factorial, x cubed, plus dot dot dot, plus the nth derivative of f evaluated at 0 over n factorial times x minus 0, which is x to the nth. And that's the Maclaurin polynomial for the approximation of f. So that's, that's the, what we call the uh, Taylor polynomial for f and the Maclaurin polynomial for f. That's what those two last things are that we wrote. And of course, if you compare this to what we did for e to the x, um, it actually agrees with what we did before. Um, it's exactly what it looked like. Um, our derivatives that we got, so that ended up being 1 over 0 factorial x to the 0 plus uh, 1 over 1 factorial x to the first plus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. That's exactly what we got. So you remember f prime of 0 for e to the x was always 1 because e to the 0 is 1. Okay. Now, if we're doing an approximation, it's really not worth much as an approximation unless we have some idea of how accurate it is. Um, to measure the accuracy of approximating a function value f of x by the Taylor polynomial p sub n of x, we can use the concept of a remainder, r sub n of x, kind of like what we talked about before. We've talked about the remainder before, so this isn't brand new. So whatever our function actually is, is going to be our approximation of it, our p nth degree polynomial approximation of it, plus the remaining part of something, it's a function of x, where the, the nth degree polynomial will go up through the x to the nth, and then everything after that that we could add um, would actually make us have the function in totality. All right, so, um, so the, the exact value is the actual function and what we'll get using the polynomial is our approximation of what that exact value is. And this is the remainder, the part that is what we don't have to get the exact answer. So our approximation plus something is actually going to be the exact value. And that remainder is what we're missing. So if we solve that equation for r sub n of x by subtraction, that's going to be f of x, our exact value, minus our approximation, is the remainder. And that leads us to um, a statement of what the error is. If r sub n is how far we are off, um, it could be positive or negative because we're subtracting. So to make it an error is always a positive quantity we'll want to take the absolute value of that remainder to get how far we are away. Like if the remainder were negative 6, that means we're 6 away from the correct answer. And that means we'd have to take the absolute value of the other side of the equation as well. And so all of these expressions that I'm writing, oops, made one too many strokes there. 
all of these expressions I'm writing are error expressions. Absolute value of r sub n of x and the absolute value of the difference between f of x and p sub n of x. The um, next theorem that we're going to see, theorem 9.19, gives us a procedure for estimating the remainder that's associated with a Taylor polynomial. This is called Taylor's theorem, and the remainder given in the theorem is called the Lagrange form of the remainder. Lagrange. Okay, so if you just read that, I'm not going to write it all down, but if a function is differentiable through the order n plus 1, so the n plus 1 derivative exists, in an interval i that contains the center of our expansion c, then for each x in that interval, there's some number z that's between x and c, and that's really important. Um, let me write that down. z is between x and c. And when we get to an example, uh, I hope that it becomes very clear. But it's, z is a number somewhere between x and c. I don't know. It could be x. It could be uh, c. But it's probably it's technically going to be between them. So like if x is 5 and c is 2, then z is some number between 2 and 5. Okay, Just so you kind of have an idea. It could be anything between, though. Um, we don't know what that between number is, by the way. Not necessarily. So um, if f of x is approximated using the Taylor polynomial, which is the first part of that, plus r sub n of x, which makes it exactly f of x, where r sub n of x is calculated by taking the n plus 1 derivative of your function and evaluating at that unknown number z and dividing by the n plus 1 factorial n plus 1 factorial times x minus c to the n plus 1. So this is kind of like that alternating series uh, estimation of, of uh, error. Remember that was um, the error is going to be less than or equal to the first neglected term. And what we're doing here is we're saying the next term of that series is where it's the n plus 1, if we stopped at n, it'll be the n plus 1 derivative and n plus 1 factorial and x minus c raised to the n plus 1. That's like the next thing we'd see. And there's some number we could put into that function, z, that's between x and c, that would exactly give us that error. And we don't know what that z is necessarily. We just know it's between x and c. Okay? And again, I think when we put that into practice with an example, it will make a whole lot more sense. So I'm going to stop the recording here and pick up with another recording to continue.